This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Devil's Dictionary by Ambrose Pierce. The letter I. I is the first letter of the alphabet, the first word of the language, the first thought of the mind, the first object of affection. In grammar it is a pronoun of the first person and singular number. Its plural is said to be we, but how there can be more than one myself is doubtless clearer to the grammarians than it is to the author of this incomparable dictionary. Conception of two myselfs is difficult, but fine. The frank yet graceful use of I distinguishes a good writer from a bad. The latter carries it with the manner of a thief trying to cloak his loot. Hicker, a noun, a fluid that serves the gods and goddesses in place of blood. Fair Venus, speared by Diomed, restrained the raging chief, and said, Behold, rash mortal, whom you've bled, your souls stained white with Ickershed. By Mary Doak. Iconoclast. Noun. A breaker of idols. The worshippers whereof are imperfectly gratified by the performance and most strenuously protest that he unbuildeth, but doth not rectify, that he pulleth down, but pileth not up. For the poor things would have other idols in place of those he thwacketh upon the mallard, and dispelleth. But the iconoclast saith, Ye shall have none at all, for ye need them not. And if the rebuilder fooleth round hereabout, behold, I will depress the head of him, and sit thereon till he squawk it. Close quote. Idiot, a noun, a member of a large and powerful tribe whose influence in human affairs has always been dominant and controlling. The idiot's activity is not confined to any special field of thought or action, but pervades and regulates the whole. He has the last word in everything. His decision is unappealable. He sets the fashions and opinion of taste, dictates the limitations of speech, and circumscribes conduct with a deadline. Idleness. Noun. A model farm where the devil experiments with seeds of new sins, and promotes the growth of staple vices. Ignoramus. Noun. A person unacquainted with certain kinds of knowledge familiar to yourself, and having certain other kinds that you know nothing about. Dumble was a ignoramus. Mumble was for learning famous. Mumble said one day to Dumble, Ignorance should be more humble. Not a spark have you of knowledge that was got in any college. Dumble said to Mumble, Truly you're self-satisfied unduly. Of things in college I'm denied, a knowledge you of all beside. By Borelli. Illuminati, a noun. A sect of Spanish heretics of the latter part of the sixteenth century, so called because they were Lightweights. Cuntaciones Illuminati. Illustrious, an adjective. Suitably placed for shafts of malice, envy, and detraction. Imagination, a noun. A warehouse of facts, with poet and liar in joint ownership. Imbecility, a noun. A kind of divine inspiration, or Sacred fire affecting censorious critics of this dictionary. Immigrant, a noun. 
an unenlightened person who thinks one country better than another. Immodest, an adjective, having a strong sense of one's own merit, coupled with a feeble conception of worth in others. There was once a man in Ispahan, ever and ever so long ago, and he had a head, the phrenologist said, that fitted him for a show. For his modesty's bump was so large a lump, nature, they said, had taken a freak, that its summit stood far above the wood of his hair, like a mountain peak. So modest a man in all Ispahan, over and over again they swore, so humble and meek, you would vainly seek, none ever was found before. Meanwhile the hump of that awful bump into the heavens contrived to get to so great a height that they called the white the man with the minaret. There wasn't a man in all Ispahan, prouder or louder in praise of his chump. With a tireless tongue and a brazen lung, he bragged of that beautiful bump, till the shah, in a rage, sent a trusty page bearing a sack and a bowstring, too, and that gentle child explained as he smiled, A little present for you. The saddest man in all Ispahan sniffed at the gift, yet accepted the same. If I'd lived, said he, my humility had given me deathless fame. By Sucre Euphro Immoral Adjective Inexpedient Whatever in the long run, and with regard to the greater number of instances, men find to be generally inexpedient, comes to be considered wrong, wicked, immoral. If man's notions of right and wrong have any other basis than this of expediency, if they originated or could have originated in any other way, if actions have in themselves a moral character apart from, and nowise dependent on their consequences, then all philosophy is a lie, and reason a disorder of the mind. Immortality Noun A toy which people cry for, and on their knees apply for, dispute, contend, and lie for, and if allowed, would be right proud, eternally, to die for. By G. J. Impale Verb, transitive In popular usage to pierce with any weapon which remains fixed in the wound. This, however, is inaccurate. To impale is, properly, to put to death by thrusting an upright sharp stake into the body, the victim being left in a sitting position. This was a common mode of punishment among many of the nations of antiquity, and is still high in favor in China and other parts of Asia. Down to the beginning of the fifteenth century it was widely employed in churching heretics and schismatics. Wolcraft calls it the stool of repenting, and among the common people it was jocularly known as riding the one-legged horse. Ludwig Salzmann informs us that in Tibet impalement is considered the most appropriate punishment for crimes against religion, and although in China it is sometimes awarded for secular offenses, it is most frequently adjudged in cases of sacrilege. To the person in actual experience of impalement, it must be a matter of minor importance by what kind of civil or religious dissent he was made acquainted with its discomforts. But, doubtless, he would have a certain satisfaction if able to contemplate himself in the character of a weathercock on the spire of the true church. Impartial and adjective unable to perceive any promise of personal advantage from espousing either side of a controversy or adopting either of two conflicting opinions. Impenitence, a noun. A state of mind intermediate in point of time between sin and punishment. Impiety, a noun. 
your irreverence toward my deity. Imposition, a noun. The act of blessing or consecrating by the laying on of hands. A ceremony common to many ecclesiastical systems, but performed with the frankest sincerity by the sect known as thieves. Lo, by the laying on of hands, say parson, priest, and dervis, we consecrate your cash and lands to ecclesiastical service. No doubt you'll swear till all is blue at such an imposition. Do. By Polo Doncas. Imposter a noun. A rival aspirant to public honors. Improbability a noun. His tale he told with a solemn face, and a tender melancholy grace. Improbable t'was, no doubt, when you came to think it out, but the fascinated crowd their deep surprise avowed, and with a single voice averred, t'was the most amazing thing they'd heard, all save one who spake never a word, but sat, as mum as if deaf and dumb, serene, indifferent, and unstirred. Then all the others turned to him, and scrutinized him limb from limb, scanned him alive. But he seemed to thrive, and tranquiller grew each minute, as if there were nothing in it. What, what, cried one, are you not amazed at what our friend has told? He raised soberly then his eyes, and gazed in a natural way, and proceeded to say, as he crossed his feet on the mantel-shelf, Oh, no, not at all. I'm a liar myself. Improvidence, a noun. Provision for the needs of today from the revenues of tomorrow. Impunity, a noun. Wealth. Inadmissible, an adjective. Not competent to be considered said of certain kinds of testimony which juries are supposed to be unfit to be entrusted with, and which judges therefore rule out, even of proceedings before themselves alone. Hearsay evidence is inadmissible because the person quoted was unsworn and is not before the court for examination. Yet most momentous actions, military, political, commercial, and of every other kind, are daily undertaken on hearsay evidence. There is no religion in the world that has any other basis than hearsay evidence. Revelation is hearsay evidence. That the scriptures are the word of God, we have only the testimony of men long dead, whose identity is not clearly established, and who are not known to have been sworn in any sense. Under the rules of evidence, as they now exist in this country, no single assertion in the Bible has, in its support, any evidence admissible in a court of law. It cannot be proved that the battle of Blenheim ever was fought, that there was such a person as Julius Caesar, such an empire as Assyria. But as records of courts of justice are admissible, it can easily be proved that powerful and malevolent magicians once existed, and were a scourge to mankind. The evidence, including confession, upon which certain women were convicted of witchcraft and executed, was without a flaw. It is still unimpeachable. The judges' decisions, based on it, were sound in logic and in law. Nothing in any existing court was ever more thoroughly proved than the charges of witchcraft and sorcery for which so many suffered death. If there were no witches, human testimony and human reason are alike destitute of value. Inauspiciously, an adverb. In an unpromising manner, the auspices being unfavorable. Among the Romans it was customary, before undertaking any important action or enterprise, to obtain from the augurs, or state prophets, some hint of its probable outcome, and one of their favorite and most trustworthy modes of divination consisted in observing the flight of birds, the omens thence derived being called auspices. 
Newspaper reporters and certain miscreant lexicographers have decided that the word, always in the plural, shall mean patronage or management, as the festivities were under the auspices of the ancient and honorable order of body-snatchers, or the hilarities were auspicated by the knights of hunger. A Roman slave appeared one day before the augur. Tell me, pray, if, here the augur, smiling, made a checking gesture, and displayed his open palm, which plainly itched, for visibly its surface twitched. A denarius, the Latin nickel, successfully allayed the tickle, and then the slave proceeded. Please inform me whether fate decrees success or failure in what I, to-night, if it be dark, shall try. Its nature? Never mind. I think tis writ on this, and with a wink, which darkened half the earth, he drew another denarius to view, its shining face attentive scanned, then slipped it into the good man's hand, who, with great gravity, said, Wait while I retire to question fate. That holy person then withdrew his scarred clay, and passing through the temple's rearward gate, cried, Shoo! waving his robe of office. Straight each sacred peacock and its mate, maintained for Juno's favor, fled with clamor from the trees o'erhead, where they were perching for the night. The temple's roof received their flight, for thither they would always go, when danger threatened them from below. Back to the slave the augur went. My son, for casting the event by flight of birds, I must confess the auspices deny success. That slave retired, a sadder man, abandoning his secret plan, which was, as well the craft seer had from the first divined, to clear the wall and fraudulently seize on Juno's poultry in the trees. By G. J. Income, a noun. The natural and rational gauge and measure of respectability, the commonly accepted standards being artificial, arbitrary, and fallacious. For, as Sir Sycophas Chrysolater in the play has justly remarked, quote, the true use and function of property, in whatsoever it consisteth, coins or land or houses or merchant stuff, or anything which may be named as holden of right to one's own subservience, as also of honors, titles, preferments, and place, and all favor and acquaintance of persons of quality or ableness, are but to get money. Hence it followeth that all things are truly to be rated as of worth in measure to their serviceableness to that end, and their possessors should take rank in agreement thereto. Neither the lord of an unproducing manner, howsoever broad and ancient, nor he who bears an unremunerate dignity, nor yet the pauper favorite of a king, being esteemed of level excellency with him whose riches are of daily accretion, and hardly should they whose wealth is barren claim and rightly take more honor than the poor and unworthy. Close quote. Incompatibility, a noun. In matrimony, a similarity of tastes, particularly the taste for domination. Incompatibility may, however, consist of a meek-eyed matron living just around the corner. It has even been known to wear a mustache. Incompossible, an adjective. Unable to exist if something else exists. Two things are incompossible when the world of being has scope enough for one of them, but not enough for both, as Walt Whitman's poetry and God's mercy to man. Incompossibility, it will be seen, is only incompatibility let loose. 
Instead of such low language as, Go heal yourself, I mean to kill you on sight, the words, Sir, we are incompossible, would convey an equally significant intimation, and in stately courtesy are altogether superior. Incubus One of a race of highly improper demons who though probably not wholly extinct, may be said to have seen their best nights. For a complete account of incubi and succubi, including incubae and succubae, see the Liber Demonorium of Protasis in Paris, 1938, published, which contains much curious information that would be out of place in a dictionary intended as a textbook for the public schools. Victor Hugo relates that in the Channel Islands, Satan himself, tempted more than elsewhere by the beauty of the women, doubtless, sometimes plays at incubus, greatly to the inconvenience and alarm of the good dames who wish to be loyal to their marriage vows, generally speaking. A certain lady applied to the parish priest to learn how they might, in the dark, distinguish the hardy intruder from their husbands. The holy man said they must feel his brown for horns. But Hugo is ungallant enough to hint a doubt of the efficacy of the test. Incumbent, a noun. A person of the liveliest interest to the outcumbents. Indecision, a noun. The chief element of success. Quote, for whereas, saith Sir Thomas Brubolt, there is but one way to do nothing, and diverse ways to do something, whereof, to a surety, only one is the right way, it followeth that he who from indecision standeth still hath not so many chances of going astray as he who pusheth forwards. Close quote. A most clear and satisfactory exposition of the matter. Quote, your prompt decision to attack, said General Grant, on a certain occasion to General Gordon Granger, was admirable. You had but five minutes to make up your mind in. Yes, sir, answered the victorious subordinate. It is a great thing to know exactly what to do in an emergency. When in doubt whether to attack or retreat, I never hesitate a moment. I toss up a copper. Do you mean to say that's what you did this time? Yes, General, but for heaven's sake, don't reprimand me. I disobeyed the coin. Indifferent, an adjective. Imperfectly sensible to distinctions among things. You tiresome man, cried Indolencio's wife. You've grown indifferent to all in life. Indifferent, he drawled, with a slow smile. I would be, dear, but it's not worth while. Apuleius M. Gokul Indigestion, a noun. A disease which the patient and his friends frequently mistake for deep religious conviction and concern for the salvation of mankind. As the simple red man of the western wild put it, with, it must be confessed, a certain force. Plenty well, no prey. Big bellyache, heap God. Indiscretion, a noun. The guilt of woman. An expedient, an adjective. Not calculated to advance one's interests. Infancy, a noun. The period of our lives when, according to Wordsworth, Heaven lies about us. The world begins lying about us pretty soon afterward. Inferiae, a noun. Latin. Among the Greeks and Romans, sacrifices for propitiation of the daimanes, or souls of the dead heroes. For the pious ancients could not invent enough gods to satisfy their spiritual needs and had to have a number of makeshift deities. Or, as a sailor might say, jury gods, which they made out of the most unpromising materials. 
It was while sacrificing a bullock to the spirit of Agamemnon that Laides, a priest of Aulis, was favored with an audience of that illustrious warrior's shade, who prophetically recounted to him the birth of Christ and the triumph of Christianity, giving him also a rapid but tolerably complete review of events down to the reign of St. Louis. The narrative ended abruptly at the point, owing to the inconsiderate crowing of a cock, which compelled the ghosted king of men to scamper back to Hades. There is a fine medieval flavor to this story, and as it has not been traced back further than Père Bretel, a pious but obscure writer at the court of St. Louis, we shall probably not err on the side of presumption in considering it apocryphal, though Monsignor Capel's judgment of the matter might be different, and to that I bow. Wow! Infidel Noun in New York, one who does not believe in the Christian religion. In Constantinople, one who does. See G-I-A-O-U-R. A kind of scoundrel, imperfectly reverent of and niggardly contributory to, divines, ecclesiastics, popes, parsons, canons, monks, mullahs, voodoos, presbyters, Hierophants, prelates, obeyamen, abbeys, nuns, missionaries, exhorters, deacons, friars, hajis, high priests, muzins, brahmins, medicine men, confessors, eminences, elders, primates, prebenderies, pilgrims, prophets, imams, beneficiaries, clerks, vicars, choral, archbishops, bishops, abbots, priors, preachers, padres, abbotesses, Calors, palmers, curates, patriarchs, bonzes, santons, beadsmen, canonesses, residentiaries, deaconesses, deans, subdeans, rural deans, abdels, charm sellers, archdeacons, hierarchs, class leaders, incumbents, capitulars, sheiks, talibans, postulants, scribes, gurus, presentors, beetles, fakers, sextons, reverences, revivalists, cenobites, perpetual curates, chaplains, mujos, readers, novices, vicars, pastors, rabbis, ulamas, lamas, sacristans, vergers, dervishes, lectors, church wardens, cardinals, prioresses, suffragans, acolytes, rectors, cures, sophies, muftis, and pum-pums. Influence, a noun. A visionary quo given in exchange for substantial quid in politics. In Phalipsarian, a noun, one who ventures to believe that Adam need not have sinned unless he had a mind to, in opposition to the supra-lapsarians who hold that luckless person's fall was decreed from the beginning. Infralapsarians are sometimes called sublapsarians without material effect upon the importance and lucidity of their views about Adam. Two theologues once, as they wended their way to chapel, engaged in colloquial fray, an earnest logomacy, bitter as gall, concerning poor Adam and what made him fall. "'Twas predestination, cried one, for the Lord decreed he should fall of his own accord. Not so. T'was free will, the other maintained, which led him to choose what the Lord had ordained. And so fierce and so fiery grew the debate that nothing but bloodshed their dungeon could sate. So off flew their cassocks and caps to the ground, and moved by the spirit their hands went round, ere either had proved his theology right by winning, or even beginning, the fight, a gray old professor of Latin came by, a staff in his hand, and a scowl in his eye, and, learning the cause of their quarrel, for still as they clumsily sparred they disputed with skill of foreordination, freedom of will, cried, Siraz! This reasonless warfare compose. Atwixt ye's 
no difference worthy of blows. The sex ye belong to, I am ready to swear, ye wrongly interpret the names that they bear. You, infralapsarian, son of a clown, should only contend that Adam slipped down, while you, you supralapsarian pup, should nothing aver but that Adam slipped up. It's all the same whether up or down you slip on a peel of banana brown. Even Adam analyzed not his blunder, but thought he had slipped on a peel of thunder. By G. J. Ingrate, a noun, one who receives a benefit from another, or is otherwise an object of charity. All men are ingrates, sneered the cynic. Nay, the good philanthropist replied. I did great service to a man one day, who never since has cursed me to repay, nor vilified. Ho! cried the cynic. Lead me to him straight, with veneration I am overcome, and fain would have his blessing. Sad your fate, he cannot bless you, for I grieve to state this man is dumb. Ariel Selp Injury Noun An offense next in degree of enormity to a slight. Injustice Noun A burden which all of those that we load upon others and carry ourselves is lightest in the hands and heaviest upon the back. Ink Noun a villainous compound of tanagalate of iron, gum arabic, and water, chiefly used to facilitate the infection of idiocy and promote intellectual crime. The properties of ink are peculiar and contradictory. It may be used to make reputations and unmake them, to blacken them and to make them white, but it is most generally and acceptably employed as a mortar to bind together the stones of an edifice of fame, and as a whitewash to conceal afterward the rascal quality of the material. There are men called journalists who have established ink baths, which some persons pay money to get into, others to get out of. Not infrequently it occurs that a person who has paid to get in pays twice as much to get out. Innate, an adjective. Natural, inherent, as innate ideas, that is to say, ideas that we are born with, having had them previously imparted to us. The doctrine of innate ideas is one of the most admirable faiths of philosophy, being itself an innate idea, and therefore inaccessible to disproof though Locke foolishly supposed himself to have given it a black eye. Among innate ideas may be mentioned the belief in one's ability to conduct a newspaper, in the greatness of one's country, in the superiority of one's civilization, in the importance of one's personal affairs, and in the interesting nature of one's own diseases. Innards, a noun. The stomach, heart, soul, and other bowels. Many eminent investigators do not class the soul as an innard, but that acute observer and renowned authority, Dr. Gonzalez, is persuaded that the mysterious organ known as the spleen is nothing less than our important part. To the contrary, Professor Garrett P. Service holds that Mansoul is that prolongation of his spinal marrow which forms the pith of his no tail, and for demonstration of his faith points confidently to the fact that no tailed animals have no souls. Concerning these two theories it is best to suspend judgment by believing both. Inscription, a noun, something written on another thing. Inscriptions are of many kinds, but mostly memorial, intended to commemorate the fame of some illustrious person, and hand down to distant ages the record of his services and virtues. To this class of inscriptions belongs the name of John Smith, penciled on the Washington Monument. Following are examples of memorial inscriptions on tombstones. 
C. Epitaph In the sky my soul is found, and my body in the ground, by and by my body will rise, to the spirit in the skies, soaring up to heaven's gate, 1878. Sacred to the memory of Jeremiah Tree Cut down May 9th, 1862, aged 27 years, 4 months, and 12 days. Indigenous Affliction sore long time she bore. Physicians was in vain. Till death released the dear deceased, and left her a remain. Gone to join Ananias in the regions of bliss. The clay that rests below this stone, as Silas Wood was widely known, now lying here, I ask what good it was to let me be, S. Wood. O oh, man, let not ambition trouble you, is the advice of Silas W. Richard Heyman of Heaven fell to earth January 20th, 1807, and had the dust brushed off him October 3rd, 1874. Insectivora, a noun. See, cries the chorus of admiring preachers, how providence provides for all his creatures. His care, the gnat said, even the insect follows. For us he has provided wrens and swallows. By Simpen Rayleigh. Insurance, a noun. An ingenious modern game of chance in which the player is permitted to enjoy the comfortable conviction that he is beating the man who keeps the table. Insurance agent. My dear sir, that is a fine house. Pray let me insure it. House owner. Oh, with pleasure. Please make the annual premiums so low that by the time when, according to the tables of your actuary, it will probably be destroyed by fire, and I will have paid you considerably less than the face of the policy. Insurance agent. Oh, dear, no. Uh, uh, we could not afford to do that. We must fix the premium so that you will have paid more. House owner. How, then, can I afford that? Insurance agent. Why, your house may burn down at any time. There was Smith's house, for example, which house under spare me. There were Brown's house, on the contrary, and Jones' house and Robinson's house, which, insurance agent, spare me. House owner, let us understand each other. You want me to pay you money on the supposition that something will occur previously to the time set by yourself for its occurrence. In other words, you expect me to bet that my house will not last so long as you say that it will probably last. Insurance agent. But if your house burns without insurance, it will be a total loss. House owner. Beg your pardon. By your own actuary's tables, I shall probably have saved, when it burns, all the premiums I would otherwise have paid you, amounting to more than the face of the policy they would have bought. But suppose it to burn uninsured before the time upon which your figures are based. If I could not afford that, how could you if it were insured? Insurance agent. Oh, huh. We should make ourselves whole from our luckier ventures with other clients. Virtually, they pay your loss. House owner. And virtually, then, don't I help to pay their losses? Are not their houses as likely as mine to burn before they have paid you as much as you must pay them? The case stands this way. You expect to make more money from your clients than you pay to them, do you not? Insurance agent. <clears throat> Certainly, if we if we did not, house owner, I would not trust you with my money. <laughs> Very well. If it is certain, with reference to the whole body of your clients, that they lose money on you, it is probable, with reference to any of them, that he will. It is these individual probabilities that make the aggregate certainty. Insurance agent. I will not deny it, but... Look at the figures in this pamphlet. House owner. Heaven forbid. 
insurance agent. You spoke of saving the premiums which you would otherwise pay to me. Will you not be more likely to squander them? We offer you an incentive to thrift. House owner. The willingness of A to take care of B's money is not peculiar to insurance, but as a charitable institution, you command esteem. Deign to accept its expression from a deserving object. Insurrection. Noun, an unsuccessful revolution. Disaffection's failure to substitute misrule for bad government. Intention, a noun. The mind's sense of the prevalence of one set of influences over another set. An effect whose cause is the imminence, immediate or remote, of the performance of an involuntary act. Interpreter, noun. One who enables two persons of different languages to understand each other by repeating to each what it would have been to the interpreter's advantage for the other to have said. Interregnum, noun. The period during which a monarchical country is governed by a warm spot on the cushion of the throne. The experiment of letting the spot grow cold has commonly been attended by most unhappy results from the zeal of many worthy persons to make it warm again. Intimacy, a noun. A relation into which fools are providentially drawn for their mutual destruction. Two sidelets powders, one in blue and one in white, together drew, and having each a pleasant sense of t'other's powder's excellence, forsook their jackets for the snug enjoyment of a common mug. So close their intimacy grew, one paper would have held the two. To confidences straight they fell, less anxious each to hear than tell, than each remorsefully confessed to all the virtues he possessed, acknowledgment he had them in so high degree, it was a sin. The more they said, the more they felt, their spirits with emotion melt, till tears of sentiment expressed their feelings. Then they effervesced. All nature executes her feats of wrath on friends and sympathetes. The good old rule, who don't apply, that you are you, and I am I. Introduction. Noun. A social ceremony invented by the devil for the gratification of his servants and the plaguing of his enemies. The introduction attains its most malevolent development in this century, being indeed closely related to our political system. Every American being the equal of every other American, it follows that everybody has the right to know everybody else, which implies the right to introduce without request or permission. The Declaration of Independence should have read thus. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life and the right to make that of another miserable by thrusting upon him an incalculable quantity of acquaintances. Liberty, particularly the liberty to introduce persons to one another without first ascertaining if they are not already acquainted as enemies, and the pursuit of another's happiness with a running pack of strangers. Inventor, noun. A person who makes an ingenious arrangement of wheels, levers, and springs, and believes it civilization. Irreligion, noun. The principal one of the great faiths of the world. 
itch, a noun. The patriotism of a Scotsman. End of letter I in the Devil's Dictionary by Ambrose Bierce. Recorded by Denny Sayers, spring of 2006 in Modesto, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com The Devil's Dictionary by Ambrose Bierce Letters J through L The letter J J is a consonant in English, but some nations use it as a vowel, than which nothing could be more absurd. Its original form, which has been but slightly modified, was that of the tail of a subdued dog, and it was not a letter, but a character, standing for a Latin verb, jacer, to throw. Because when a stone is thrown at a dog, the dog's tail assumes that shape. This is the origin of the letter, as expounded by the renowned Dr. Jocolpus Bumer, of the University of Belgrade, who established his conclusions on the subject in a work of three quarto volumes, and committed suicide on being reminded that the J in the Roman alphabet had originally no curl. Jealous. Adjective. Unduly concerned about the preservation of that which can be lost only if it is not worth keeping. Jester. Noun. An officer formerly attached to a king's household, whose business it was to amuse the court by ludicrous actions and utterances, the absurdity being attested by his motley costume. The king himself being attired with dignity, it took the world some centuries to discover that his own conduct and decrees were sufficiently ridiculous for the amusement not only of his court, but of all mankind. The jester was commonly called a fool, but the poets and romancers have ever delighted to represent him as a singularly wise and witty person. In the circus of today, the melancholy ghost of the court fool affects the dejection of humbler audiences with the same jests wherewith in life he gloomed the marble hall, pang the patrician sense of humor, and tap the tank of royal tears. The widow queen of Portugal had an audacious jester, who entered the confessional, disguised, and there confessed her. Father, said she, thine ear bend down, my sins are more than scarlet. I love my fool, blaspheming clown, and common base-born varlet. Daughter, the mimic priest replied, that sin indeed is awful. The church's pardon is denied to love that is unlawful. But since thy stubborn heart will be for him forever pleading, thou'dst better make him by decree a man of birth and breeding. She made the fool a duke in hope, with heaven's taboo to palter, then told the priest, who told the pope, who damned her from the altar. By Beryl Dort. Jew's harp, noun, an unmusical instrument played by holding it fast with the teeth and trying to brush it away with the finger. Jaw sticks, noun. Small sticks burned by the Chinese in their pagan tomfoolery, in imitation of certain sacred rites of our holy religion. Justice, noun. A commodity which, in a more or less adulterated condition, the state sells to the citizen as a reward for his allegiance, taxes, and personal service. The letter K. K is a consonant that we get from the Greeks, but it can be traced away back beyond them to the Serathians, a small commercial nation inhabiting the peninsula of Smero. In their tongue it was called clatch, which means destroyed. The form of the letter was originally precisely that of our H, but the erudite Dr. Snedeker 
explains that it was altered to the present shape to commemorate the destruction of the great temple of Jarut by an earthquake circa 730 B.C. This building was famous for the two lofty columns of its portico, one of which was broken in half by the catastrophe, the other remaining intact. As the earlier form of the letter is supposed to have been suggested by these pillars, so, it is thought by the great antiquary, its later was adopted as a simple and natural, not to say touching, means of keeping the calamity ever in the national memory. It is not known if the name of the letter was altered as an additional mnemonic, or if the name was always Clatch, and the destruction one of nature's puns. As each theory seems probable enough, I see no objection to believing both, and Dr. Snedeker arrayed himself on that side of the question. Keep. Transitive verb. He willed away his whole estate, and then in death he fell asleep, murmuring, well, at any rate, my name unblemished I shall keep. But when upon the tomb t'was wrought, whose was it? For the dead keep not. By Durango fell Arn. Kill. Transitive verb. To create a vacancy without nominating a successor. Kilt. Noun. A costume sometimes worn by Scotchmen in America, and Americans in Scotland. Kindness. Noun. A brief preface to ten volumes of exaction. King. Noun. A male person commonly known in America as a, quote, crowned head, unquote, although he never wears a crown, and has usually no head to speak of. A king, in times long, long gone by, said to his lazy jester, If I were you, and you were I, my moments merrily would fly, no care nor grief to pester. The reason, sire, that you would thrive, the fool said, if you'll hear it, is that of all the fools alive, who own you for their sovereign, I've the most forgiving spirit. By Ugam Bem King's Evil. Noun. A malady that was formerly cured by the touch of the sovereign, but has now to be treated by the physicians. Thus, the most pious Edward of England used to lay his royal hand upon the ailing subjects and to make them whole. A crowd of wretched souls that stay his cure, their malady convinces the great essay of art. But at his touch, such sanctity hath heaven given his hand, they presently amend as the doctor in Macbeth hath it. This useful property of the royal hand could, it appears, be transmitted along with other crown properties, for, according to Malcolm, tis spoken to the succeeding royalty he leaves the healing benediction. But the gift somewhere dropped out of the line of succession. The later sovereigns of England have not been tactual healers, and the disease once honored with the name King's Evil now bears the humbler one of scrofula, from scrofa, a sow. The date and author of the following epigram are known only to the author of this dictionary, but it is old enough to show that the jest about Scotland's national disorder is not a thing of yesterday. Ye king his evil in me lay, which he of Scotland charmed away. He laid his hand on mine and said, Be gone! Ye ill no longer stayed. But, oh, ye woeful plight in which I'm now ye pight, I have ye itch. The superstition that maladies can be cured by royal taction is dead, but, like many a departed conviction, it has left a monument of custom to keep its memory green. The practice of forming a line and shaking the president's hand had no other origin and when that great dignitary bestows his healing salutation on strangely visited people, all swollen and ulcerous, pitiful to the eye, the mere despair of surgery. He and his patients are handing along an extinguished torch, which once was kindled at the altar fire of a faith long held by all classes of men. It is a beautiful and edifying survival, one which brings the sainted past close home in our 
business and bosoms. Kiss. Noun. A word invented by the poets as a rhyme for bliss. It is supposed to signify, in a general way, some kind of rite or ceremony appertaining to a good understanding, but the manner of its performance is unknown to this lexicographer. Kleptomaniac. Noun. A rich thief. Knight. Noun. Once a warrior gentle of birth, then a person of civic worth, now a fellow to move our mirth. Warrior, person, and fellow, no more. We must knight our dogs to get any lower. Brave knights' kennelers then shall be noble knights of the golden flea, knights of the order of St. Stiboy, knights of St. George and Sir Knights Jawoy. God speed the day when this knighting fad shall go to the dogs. And the dogs go mad. Quran, noun, a book which the Mohammedans foolishly believe to have been written by divine inspiration, but which Christians know to be a wicked imposture contradictory to the holy scriptures. The letter L. Labor, noun, one of the processes by which A acquires property for B. Land, noun, a part of the earth's surface considered as property. The theory that land is property subject to private ownership and control is the foundation of modern society and is eminently worthy of the superstructure. Carried to its logical conclusion, it means that some have the right to prevent others from living, for the right to own implies the right exclusively to occupy, and in fact laws of trespass are enacted wherever property in land is recognized. It follows that if the whole area of terra firma is owned by A, B, and C, there will be no place for D, E, F, and G to be born, or born as trespassers, to exist. A life on the ocean wave a home on the rolling deep, for the spark the nature gave, I have there the right to keep. They give me the cat o' nine whenever I go ashore, then ho for the flashing brine, I'm a natural commodore. By Dodal. Language. Noun. The music with which we charm the serpents guarding another's treasure. Lao Koan. Noun. A famous piece of antique sculpture representing a priest of that name and his two sons in the folds of two enormous serpents. The skill and diligence with which the old man and lads support the serpents and keep them up to their work have been justly regarded as one of the noblest artistic illustrations of the mastery of human intelligence over brute inertia. Lap. Noun. One of the most important organs of the female system, an admirable provision of nature for the repose of infancy, but chiefly useful in rural festivities to support plates of cold chicken and heads of adult males. The male of our species has a rudimentary lap, imperfectly developed, and in no way contributing to the animal's substantial welfare. Last, noun. A shoemaker's implement, named by a frowning providence as opportunity to the maker of puns. Ah, punster, would thy lot were cast, where the cobbler is unknown, so that I might forget his last, and hear your own. By Gargo Repsky. Laughter. Noun. An interior convulsion producing a distortion of the features and accompanied by inarticulate noises. It is infectious and, though intermittent, incurable. Liability to attacks of laughter is one of the characteristics distinguishing man from the animals, these being not only inaccessible to the provocation of his example, but impregnable to the microbes having original jurisdiction in bestowal of the disease. Whether laughter could be imparted to animals by inoculation from the human patient is a question that has not been answered by experimentation. 
Dr. Mir Witchell holds that the infectious character of laughter is due to the instantaneous fermentation of sputa diffused in a spray. From this peculiarity, he names the disorder convulsio spargens. Laureate, adjective, crowned with leaves of the laurel. In England, the poet laureate is an officer of the sovereign's court, acting as dancing skeleton at every royal feast and singing mute at every royal funeral. Of all incumbents of that high office, Robert Southey had the most notable knack at drugging the Samson of public joy and cutting his hair to the quick, and he had an artistic color sense, which enabled him to so blacken a public grief as to give it the aspect of a national crime. Laurel. Noun. The laurus, a vegetable dedicated to Apollo, and formerly defoliated, to wreathe the brows of victors and such poets as had influence at court. Vide Supra. Law. Noun. Once Law was sitting on the bench, and Mercy knelt a-weeping. Clear out, he cried, disordered wench, nor come before me creeping. Upon your knees, if you appear, tis plain you have no standing here. Then justice came, his honor cried, your status, devil seize you. Amica curiae, she replied, friend of the court, so please you. Begone, he shouted, there's the door, I never saw your face before. By G. J. Lawful, adjective. Compatible with the will of a judge having jurisdiction. Lawyer. Noun. One skilled in circumvention of the law. Laziness. Noun. Unwarranted repose of manner in a person of low degree. Lead. Noun. A heavy blue-gray metal, much used in giving stability to light lovers, particularly to those who love not wisely, but other men's wives. Lead is also of great service as a counterpoise to an argument of such weight that it turns the scale of debate the wrong way. An interesting fact in the chemistry of international controversy is that at the point of contact of two patriotisms, lead is precipitated in great quantities. Hail, holy lead, of human feuds, the great and universal arbiter endowed, with penetration to pierce any cloud, fogging the field of controversial hate, and with a swift, inevitable, straight, searching precision, find the unavowed, but vital point, thy judgment, when allowed, by the chirurgeon settles the debate. O oh, useful metal, were it not for thee, We'd grapple one another's ears alway, but when we hear thee buzzing like a bee, we, like old Muhlenberg, care not to stay. And when the quick have run away like pellets, Jack Satan smelts the dead to make new bullets. Learning. Noun. The kind of ignorance distinguishing the studious. Lecturer. Noun. One with his hand in your pocket, his tongue in your ear, and his faith in your patience. Legacy. Noun. A gift from one who is legging it out of this veil of tears. Leonine. Adjective. Unlike a menagerie lion. Leonine verses are those in which a word in the middle of a line rhymes with a word at the end, as in this famous passage, from Bella Peeler Silcox. The electric light invades the dunnest deep of Hades, cries Pluto twixt his snores, O tempora, O mores. It should be explained that Mrs. Silcox does not undertake to teach pronunciation of the Greek and Latin tongues. Leonine verses are so called in honor of a poet named Leo whom prosodists appear to find a pleasure in believing, to have been the first to discover that a rhyming couplet could be run into a single line. Lettuce. Noun. An herb of the genus Lactuca, wherewith, says that pious gastronome, Hengist Pelly, God has been pleased to reward the good and punish the wicked, 
For by his inner light the righteous man Has discerned a manner of compounding for it addressing To the appetency whereof a multitude of gustable condiments aspire Being reconciled and ameliorated with profusion of oil The entire comestible making glad the heart of the godly And causing his face to shine But the person of spiritual unworth is successfully tempted to the adversary to eat of lettuce with destitution of oil, mustard, egg, salt, and garlic, and with a rascal bath of vinegar polluted with sugar. Wherefore, the person of spiritual unworth suffers an intestinal pang of strange complexity and raises the song. Leviathan, noun, an enormous aquatic animal mentioned by Job, some suppose it to have been the whale, but that distinguished ichthyologer Dr. Jordan of Stanford University maintains with considerable heat that it was a species of gigantic tadpole, Thaddeus polendensis, or polywig, Maria pseudohirsuta. For an exhaustive description and history of the tadpole, consult the famous monograph of Jane Potter, Thaddeus of Warsaw. Lexicographer, noun, a pestilent fellow who, under the pretense of recording some particular stage in the development of a language, does what he can to arrest its growth, stiffen its flexibility, and mechanize its methods. For your lexicographer, having written his dictionary, comes to be considered as one having authority, whereas his function is only to make a record, not to give a law. The natural servility of the human understanding, having invested him with judicial power, surrenders its right of reason, and submits itself to a chronicle as if it were a statute. Let the dictionary, for example, mark a good word as obsolete or obsolescent, and few men thereafter venture to use it, whatever their need of it, and however desirable its restoration to favor whereby the process of impoverishment is accelerated and speech decays. On the contrary, recognizing the truth that language must grow by innovation, if it grow at all, makes new words, and uses the old in an unfamiliar sense, has no following, and is tartly reminded that it isn't in the dictionary. Although down to the time of the first lexicographer, heaven forgive him, no author ever had used a word that was in the dictionary. In the golden prime and high noon of English speech, when from the lips of the great Elizabethans fell words that made their own meaning and carried it in their very sound, when a Shakespeare and a Bacon were possible, and the language now rapidly perishing at one end and slowly renewed at the other was in vigorous growth and hardy preservation, sweeter than honey and stronger than a lion, the lexicographer was a person unknown. The dictionary, a creation which his creator had not created him to create. God said, Let spirit perish into form, and lexicographers arose, a swarm. Thought fled, and left her clothing, which they took, and catalogued each garment in a book. Now, from her leafy covert, when she cries, Give me my clothes, and I'll return, they rise, And scan the list, and say without compassion, Excuse us, they are mostly out of fashion. By Sigismund Smith Liar, noun, a lawyer with a roving commission. Liberty, noun, one of imagination's most precious possessions. The rising people, hot and out of breath, roared round the palace, Liberty or death! If death will do, the king said, let me reign. You'll have, I'm sure, no reason to complain. By Martha Braymans. Lickspittle, noun. A useful functionary, not infrequently found editing a newspaper. In his character of editor, he is closely allied to the blackmailer by the tie of occasional identity, for in truth the lickspittle is only the blackmailer under another aspect, although the latter is frequently found as an independent species. Lickspittling is more detestable than blackmailing, 
precisely as the business of a confidence man is more detestable than that of a highway robber. And the parallel maintains itself throughout, for whereas few robbers will cheat, every sneak will plunder if he dare. Life. Noun. A spiritual pickle preserving the body from decay. We live in daily apprehension of its loss, yet when lost it is not missed. The question, is life worth living, has been much discussed, particularly by those who think it is not, many of whom have written at great length in support of their view, and, by a careful observance of the laws of health, enjoyed for long terms of years the honors of successful controversy. Life's not worth living, and that's the truth, carelessly caroled the golden youth. In manhood still he maintained that view, and held it more strongly the older he grew. When kicked by a jackass at eighty-three, Go fetch me a surgeon at once, cried he. By Hans Soper Lighthouse, noun. A tall building on the seashore, in which the government maintains a lamp and the friend of a politician. Limb, noun. The branch of a tree or the leg of an American woman. T'was a pair of boots that the lady bought, and the salesman laced them tight to a very remarkable height. Higher, indeed, than I think he ought, higher than can be right. For the Bible declares, but never mind, it is hardly fit to censure freely and fault to find with others for sins I am not inclined myself to commit. Each has his weakness, and though my own is freedom from every sin, it still were unfair to pitch in, discharging the first censorious stone. Besides, the truth compels me to say, the boots in question were made that way. As he drew the lace, she made a grimace, and blushingly said to him, this boot, I'm sure, is too high to endure. It hurts my, hurts my limb. The salesman smiled in a manner mild, like an artless, undesigning child. Then, checking himself, to his face he gave a look as sorrowful as the grave, though he didn't care two figs for her paints and throws as he stroked her toes, remarking with speech and manner just befitting his calling, Madam, I trust that it doesn't hurt your twigs. By B. Percival Dyke Linen Noun Quote, A kind of cloth, the making of which, when made of hemp, entails a great waste of hemp. Unquote. Attributed to Calcraft the Hangman Litigant Noun A person about to give up his skin for the hope of retaining his bones. Litigation. Noun. A machine which you go into as a pig and come out of as a sausage. Liver. Noun. A large red organ thoughtfully provided by nature to be bilious with. The sentiments and emotions which every literary anatomist now knows to haunt the heart were anciently believed to infest the liver, and even Gascoigne, speaking of the emotional side of human nature, calls it our hepatical part. It was at one time considered the seat of life, hence its name, liver, the thing we live with. The liver is heaven's best gift to the goose. Without it, that bird would be unable to supply us with the Strasbourg pâté. LLD. Letters indicating the degree Legumptionorum Doctor, one learned in laws, gifted with legal gumption. Some suspicion is cast upon this derivation by the fact that the title was formerly LLD with a lower case D, and conferred only upon gentlemen distinguished for their wealth. At the date of this writing, Columbia University is considering the expediency of making another degree for clergymen in place of the old DD, Damnator Diaboli. The new honor will be known as Sanctorum Custis, and written dollar sign, dollar sign, lowercase c. The name of the Reverend John Satan has been suggested as a suitable recipient by a lover of consistency 
who points out that Professor Harry Thurston Peck has long enjoyed the advantage of a degree. Lock and key. Noun. The distinguishing device of civilization and enlightenment. Lodger. Noun. A less popular name for the second person of that delectable newspaper trinity, the rumor, the better, and the mealer. Logic. Noun. The art of thinking and reasoning in strict accordance with the limitations and incapacities of the human misunderstanding. The basis of logic is the syllogism, consisting of a major and a minor premise and a conclusion. Thus, major premise. Sixty men can do a piece of work sixty times as quickly as one man. Minor premise. One man can dig a post hole in sixty seconds. Therefore, conclusion. Sixty men can dig a post hole in one second. This may be called the syllogism arithmetical, in which, by combining logic and mathematics, we obtain a double certainty and are twice blessed. Logomachy. Noun. A war in which the weapons are words, and the wounds punctures in the swim bladder of self-esteem. A kind of contest in which, the vanquished being unconscious of defeat, the victor is denied the reward of success. "'Tis said by divers of the scholar-men "'that poor Salmasius died of Milton's pen. "'Alas, we cannot know if this is true, "'for reading Milton's wit, we perish too.'" Longanimity. Noun. The disposition to endure injury with meek forbearance while maturing a plan of revenge. Longevity. Noun. Uncommon extension of the fear of death. Looking glass. Noun. A vitreous plane upon which to display a fleeting show for man's disillusion given. The king of Manchuria had a magic looking glass, whereon whoso looked saw not his own image, but only that of the king. A certain courtier, who had long enjoyed the king's favor, and was thereby enriched beyond any other subject of the realm, said to the king, Give me, I pray, thy wonderful mirror, so that when absent out of thine august presence I may yet do homage before thy visible shadow, prostrating myself night and morning in the glory of thy benign countenance, as which nothing has so divine splendor, O noonday sun of the universe." Pleased with the speech, the king commanded that the mirror be conveyed to the courtier's palace. But after, having gone thither without apprisal, he found it in an apartment where was naught but idle lumber, and the mirror was dimmed with dust and overlaced with cobwebs. This so angered him that he fisted it hard, shattering the glass, and was sorely hurt. Enraged all the more by this mischance, he commanded that the ungrateful courtier be thrown into prison, and that the glass be repaired and taken back to his own palace. And this was done. But when the king looked again on the mirror, he saw not his image as before, but only the figure of a crowned ass having a bloody bandage on one of its hinder hooves, as the artificers and all who had looked upon it had before discerned but feared to report. Taught wisdom and charity, the king restored his courtier to liberty, and had the mirror set into the back of the throne, and reigned many years with justice and humility. And one day, when he fell asleep in death while on the throne, the whole court saw in the mirror the luminous figure of an angel, which remains to this day. Loquacity. Noun. A disorder which renders the sufferer unable to curb his tongue when you wish to talk. Lord. Noun. In American society, an English tourist above the state of a costermonger, as Lord Aberdasher, Lord Hartison, and so forth. The traveling Briton of lesser degree is addressed as Sir, as Sir Ari Donkey Boy, or Amstead Eath. The word Lord is sometimes used, also, as a title of the Supreme Being, but this is thought to be rather flattery than true reverence. Miss Sally Anne Spludge, of her own accord, 
wedded a wandering English lord, wedded and took him to dwell with her paw, a parent who throve by the practice of draw. Lord Cad, I don't hesitate to declare, unworthy the father in legal care, of that elderly sport, notwithstanding the truth, that Cad had renounced all the follies of youth. For, sad to relate, he derived at the stage of existence that's marked by the vices of age. Among them cupidity caused him to urge repeated demands on the pocket of splurge, till, wrecked in his fortune, that gentleman saw an adequate aid in the practice of draw, and took, as a means of augmenting his pelf, to the business of being a lord himself. His neat-fitting garments he willfully shed, and sacked himself strangely in checks instead, denuded his chin, but retained at each ear a whisker that looked like a blasted career. He painted his neck an incarnadine hue each morning, and varnished it all that he knew. The moony monocular set in his eye appeared to be scanning the sweet by and by. His head was enroofed with a billycock hat, and his low-necked shoes were adunctious and flat. In speech he eschewed his American ways, denying his nose to the use of his A's, and dulling their edge till the delicate sense of a babe at their temper could take no offence. His ages, twas most inexpressibly sweet, the patter they made as they fell at his feet. Re-outfitted thus, Mr. Splurge, without fear, began as Lord Splurge his recouping career. Alas, the divinity shaping his end, entertained other views, and decided to send his lordship in horror, despair, and dismay, from the land of the nobleman's natural prey. For, smit with his old-world ways, Lady Cad fell, suffering Caesar, in love with her dad. By G. J. Lore. Noun. Learning. Particularly that sort which is not derived from a regular course of instruction, but comes of the reading of occult books or by nature. This latter is commonly designated as folklore, and embraces popularly myths and superstitions. In Barry Gould's Curious Myths of the Middle Ages, the reader will find many of these traced backward through various peoples on converging lines toward a common origin in remote antiquity. Among these are the fables of Teddy the Giant Killer, the sleeping John Sharp Williams, Little Red Riding Hood and the Sugar Trust, Beauty and the Brisbane, the Seven Aldermen of Ephesus, Rip Van Fairbanks, and so forth. The fable that Goethe so affectingly relates under the title of The Earl King was known two thousand years ago in Greece as The Demos and the Infant Industry. One of the most general and ancient of these myths is that Arabian tale of Ali Baba and the Forty Rockefellers. Loss Noun Privation of that which we had, or had not. Thus, in the latter sense, it is said of a defeated candidate that he lost his election, and of that eminent man, the poet Gilder, that he has lost his mind. It is in the former and more legitimate sense that the word is used in the famous epitaph. Here Huntington's ashes long have lain, whose loss is our eternal gain. For while he exercised all his powers, whatever he gained, the loss was ours. Love. Noun. A temporary insanity, curable by marriage, or by removal of the patient from the influences under which he incurred the disorder. This disease, like caries and many other ailments, is prevalent only among civilized races living under artificial conditions. Barbarous nations, breathing pure air and eating simple food, enjoy immunity from its ravages. It is sometimes fatal, but more frequently to the physician than to the patient. Low-bred, adjective, raised instead of brought up. Luminary, noun, one who throws light upon a subject as an editor by not writing about it. 
Lunarian, noun. An inhabitant of the moon, as distinguished from lunatic, one whom the moon inhabits. The Lunarians have been described by Lucian, Locke, and other observers, but without much agreement. For example, Rogello severs their anatomical identity with man, but Professor Newcomb says they are more like the hill tribes of Vermont. Lyre, noun, an ancient instrument of torture. The word is now used in a figurative sense to denote the poetic faculty, as in the following fiery lines of our great poet Ella Wheeler Wilcox. I sit astride Parnassus with my lyre, and pick with care the disobedient wire, that stupid shepherd lolling on his crook, with deaf attention scarcely deigns to look. I bide my time, and it shall come at length, when, with a titan's energy and strength, I'll grab a fistful of the strings, and, oh, the world shall suffer when I let them go. By Farquharson Harris End of Letters J through L in The Devil's Dictionary Recorded May 2006「ゲイトゥーエルイン・アンド・ザ・デヴェルズ・ディクション」「ゲイトゥーエルイン・アンド・ザ・デヴェルズ・ディクション」「ゲイトゥーエルイン・アンド・ザ・デヴェルズ・ディク Its form, that of a heavy club, indicates its original purpose and use in dissuading from dissent. Machination, noun. The method employed by one's opponents in baffling one's open and honorable efforts to do the right thing. So plain the advantages of machination, it constitutes a moral obligation, and honest wolves who think upon it with loathing feel bound to don the sheep's deceptive clothing. So prosper still the diplomatic art, and Satan bows with hand upon its heart. Tributed to R. S. K. Macrobian, noun. One forgotten of the gods and living to a great age. History is abundantly supplied with examples from Methuselah to Old Parr, but some notable instances of longevity are less well known. A Calabrian peasant named Coloni, born in 1753, lived so long that he had what he considered a glimpse of the dawn of universal peace. Scandinavius relates that he knew an archbishop who was so old that he could remember a time when he did not deserve hanging. In 1566, a linen draper of Bristol, England, declared that he had lived 500 years, and that in all that time he had never told a lie. There are instances of longevity, macrobiosis, in our own country. Senator Chauncey d e p o u x is old enough to know better. The editor of The American, a newspaper in New York City, has a memory that goes back to the time when he was a rascal, but not to the fact. The President of the United States was born so long ago that many of the friends of his youth have risen to high political and military preferment without the assistance of personal merit. The verses following were written by a Macrobian. When I was young, the world was fair and amiable and sunny. A brightness was in all the air, in all the waters, honey. The jokes were fine and funny, the statesmen honest in their views. And in their lives as well, and when you heard a bit of news, twas true enough to tell men were not ranting, shouting, reeking, nor women generally speaking. The summer then was long indeed, it lasted one whole season. The sparkling winter gave no heed, when ordered by unreason, to bring the early peas on. Now, where the dickens is the sense in calling that a year, which does no more than just commence before the end is near? When I was young, the year extended from month to month until it ended. I know not why the world has changed to something dark and dreary, and everything is now arranged to make a fellow weary. The weatherman, I fear he has too much to do with it for sure, 
The air is not the same. It chokes you when it is impure. When pure, it makes you lame. With windows closed, you are asthmatic, open, neurologic, or sciatic. Well, I suppose this new regime of done degeneration seems eviler than it would seem to a better observation, and has for compensation some blessings in a deep disguise, which mortal sight has failed to pierce, although to angels' eyes they're visibly unveiled. If age is such a boon, good land, he's costumed by a master hand. By Venerable Strig. Mad Adjective affected with a high degree of intellectual independence, not conforming to standards of thought, speech, and action derived by the conformance from study of themselves, at odds with the majority, in short, unusual. It is noteworthy that persons are pronounced mad by officials destitute of evidence that they themselves are sane. For illustration, this present and illustrious lexographer is no firmer in the faith of his own sanity than is any inmate of any madhouse in the land. Yet for aught he knows to the contrary, instead of the lofty occupation that seems to him to be engaging his powers, he may really be beating his hands against the window bars of an asylum and declaring himself Noah Webster to the innocent delight of many thoughtless spectators. Magdalene, noun, an inhabitant of Magdala, popularly a woman found out. This definition of the word has the authority of ignorance, Mary of Magdala being another person than the penitent woman mentioned by St. Luke. It has also the official sanction of the governments of Great Britain and the United States. In England the word is pronounced maudlin, whence maudlin, adjective, unpleasantly sentimental with their maudlin for Magdalen and their bedlam for Bethlehem, the English may justly boast themselves the greatest of revisers. Magic. Noun. An art of converting superstition into coin. There are other arts serving the same high purpose, but the discreet lexicographer does not name them. Magnet. Noun. Something acted upon by magnetism. Magnetism. Noun. Something acting upon a magnet. The two definitions immediately foregoing are condensed from the works of 1,000 eminent scientists who have illuminated the subject with a great white light to the inexpressible advancement of human knowledge. Magnificent. Adjective. Having a grandeur or splendor superior to that which the spectator is accustomed, as the ears of an ass to a rabbit, or the glory of a glowworm to a maggot. Magnitude. Noun. Size. Magnitude being purely relative, nothing is large and nothing is small. If everything in the universe were increased in bulk 1,000 diameters, nothing would be any larger than it was before. But if one thing remained unchanged, all the others would be larger than they had been. To an understanding familiar with the relativity of magnitude and distance, the spaces and masses of the astronomer would be no more impressive than those of the microscopist. For anything we know to the contrary, the visible universe may be a small part of an atom with its component ions floating in the life fluid, luminiferous ether, of some animal. Possibly the wee creatures peopling the corpuscles of our blood are overcome with the proper emotion when contemplating the unthinkable distance from one of these to another. Magpie, noun. A bird whose thievish disposition suggested to someone that it might be taught to talk. Maiden, noun. A young person of the unfair sex addicted to clueless conduct and views that madden to crime. The genus has a wide geographical distribution, being found wherever sought and deplored whenever found. The maiden is not altogether unpleasing to the eye, nor, without her piano and her views, insupportable to the ear, though in respect to comeliness distinctly inferior to the rainbow, and with regard to the part of her that is audible, beaten out of the field by the canary, which also is more portable. A lovelorn maiden she sat and sang, 
This quaint sweet song sang she, It's O oh for a youth with a football bang, And a muscle fair to see. The captain he of a team to be, On a gridiron he shall shine. A monarch by right divine, And never to roast on it me. By Opaline Jones. Majesty. Noun. The state and title of a king, regarded with a just contempt by the most eminent grand masters, grand chancellors, great incajones, and imperial potentates of the ancient and honorable orders of Republican America. Male. Now. A member of the unconsidered or negligible sex. The male of the human race is commonly known to the female as mere man. The genus has two varieties, good providers and bad providers. Malefactor, noun, the chief factor in the progress of the human race. Malthusian, adjective, pertaining to Malthus and his doctrines. Malthus believed in artificially limiting population, but found that it could not be done by talking. One of the most practical exponents of the Malthusian idea was Herod of Judea, though all the famous soldiers have been of the same way of thinking. Mammalia, noun, plural. A family of vertebrate animals whose females in a state of nature suckle their young, but when civilized and enlightened put them out to nurse or use the bottle. Mammon, noun. The god of the world's leading religion. His chief temple is in the holy city of New York. He swore that all other religions were gammon, and wore out his knees in the worship of mammon. By Jared Oomph. Man. Noun. An animal so lost in rapturous contemplation of what he thinks he is, as to overlook what he indubitably ought to be. His chief occupation is extermination of other animals and his own species, which, however, multiplies with such insistent rapidity as to infest the whole habitable earth and Canada. When the world was young and man was new, when everything was pleasant, distinctions nature never drew. Amongst king and priest and peasant were not that way at present, save here in this republic, where we have that old regime, for all we are kings, however bare, their backs, however extreme, their hunger, and indeed each has a voice to accept the tyrant of his party's choice. A citizen who would not vote, and therefore was detested, was one day with a terry coat, with feathers backed and breasted, by patriots invested. It is your duty, cried the crowd, your ballot true to cast for the man of your choice. He humbly bowed and explained his wicked past. That's what I verily gladly would have done, dear patriots, but he has never run. By Apperton Duke. Mains. Now. The immortal parts of dead Greeks and Romans. They were in a state of dull discomfort, until the bodies from which they had exhaled were buried and burned, and they seemed not to have been particularly happy afterward. Manichaeism. Noun. The ancient Persian doctrine of an incessant warfare between good and evil. When good gave up the fight, the Persians joined the victorious opposition. Manna. Noun. A food miraculously given to the Israelites in the wilderness. When it was no longer supplied to them, they settled down and tilled the soil, fertilizing it, as a rule, with the bodies of the original occupants. Marriage. Noun. The state or condition of a community consisting of a master, a mistress, and two slaves, making in all two. Martyr. Noun. One who moves along the line of least reluctance to a desired death. Material. Adjective. Having an actual existence as distinguished from an imaginary one. Important. Material things I know, or feel, or see. All else is immaterial to me. Attributed to Jamarak Holombom. Mausoleum. Noun. 
the final and funniest folly of the rich. Mayonnaise, noun, one of the sauces which serve the French in place of a state religion. Me, pronoun, the objectionable case of I. The personal pronoun in English has three cases, the dominative, the objectionable, and the oppressive. Each is all three. Meander, noun, to proceed sinuously and aimlessly. The word is the ancient name of a river about 150 miles south of Troy, which turned and twisted in the effort to get out of hearing when the Greeks and Trojans boasted of their prowess. Metal, noun, a small metal disc given as a reward for virtues, attainments, or services more or less authentic. It is related of Bismarck, who had been awarded a medal for gallantry, rescuing a drowning person, that being asked the meaning of the medal, he replied, I save lives sometimes. And sometimes he didn't. Medicine, noun, a stone flung down the Bowery to kill a dog in Broadway. Meekness, noun, uncommon patience in planning a revenge that is worth while. M is for Moses, who slew the Egyptian. As sweet as a rose is the meekness of Moses. No monument shows his post-mortem inscription, but M is for Moses, who slew the Egyptian. From the Biographical Alphabet. Mersham, noun, literally sea foam, and by many erroneously supposed to be made of it. A fine white clay, which for convenience in coloring it brown, is made into tobacco pipes, and smoked by the workmen engaged in that industry. The purpose of coloring it has not been disclosed by the manufacturer. There was a youth, you've heard before this woeful tale may be, who bought a Mersham pipe, and swore that color it would he. He shut himself from the world away, nor any soul he saw. He smoked by night, he smoked by day, as hard as he could draw. His dog died moaning in the wrath of winds that blew aloof. The winds were in the gravel path, the owl was on the roof. He's gone afar, he'll come no more, the neighbors sadly say, and so they batter in the door to take his goods away. Dead pipe in mouth the youngster lay, nut brown in face and limb. That pipe's a lovely white, they say, but it has colored him. The moral there's small need to sing, tis plain as day to you. Don't play your game on anything that is a gamester, too. By Martin Bolstrode. Mendacious. Adjective. Addicted to rhetoric. Merchant. Noun. One engaged in a commercial pursuit. A commercial pursuit is one in which the thing pursued is a dollar. Mercy. Noun. An attribute beloved of detected offenders. Mesmerism. Noun. Hypnotism, before it wore good clothes, kept a carriage, and asked incredulity to dinner. Metropolis. Noun. A stronghold of provincialism. Millennium. Noun. The period of a thousand years, when the lid is to be screwed down with all reformers on the underside. Mind. Noun. A mysterious form of matter secreted by the brain. Its chief activity consists in the endeavor to assert its own nature, the futility of the attempt being due to the fact that it has nothing but itself to know itself with. From the Latin mens, a fact unknown to that honest shoe-seller, who, observing that his learned competitor over the way had displayed the motto, Mens Concia Recti, emblazoned his own shop front with the words, Mens, Women's, and Children's Concia Recti. Mine, adjective, belonging to me if I can hold or seize it. Minister, noun, an agent of a higher power with a lower responsibility. In diplomacy, an officer sent into a foreign country as the visible embodiment of his sovereign's hostility. His principal qualification is a degree of plausible and veracity next below that of an ambassador. Minor, adjective, less objectionable. Minstrel, adjective, 
formerly a poet, singer, magician, now a nigger with a color less than skin deep and a humor more than flesh and blood can bear. Miracle. Noun. An act or event out of the order of nature and unaccountable, as beating a normal hand of four kings and an ace, with four aces and a king. Miscreant, noun. A person of the highest degree of unworth. Entomologically, the word means unbeliever, and its present signification may be regarded as theology's noblest contribution to the development of our language. Misdemeanor, noun. An infraction of a law having a less dignity than a felony, and constituting no claim to admittance into the best criminal society. By misdemeanors he essayed to climb into the aristocracy of crime. Oh, woe was him with manner chill and grand. Captains of industry refused his hand. Kings of finance denied him recognition, and railway magnates jeered his low condition. He robbed a bank to make himself respected. They still rebuffed him, for he was detected. By S. V. Hanniper. Misericorde. Now. A dagger which in medieval warfare was used by the foot soldier to remind an unhorsed knight that he was mortal. Misfortune, noun, the kind of fortune that never misses. Miss, noun, a title with which we brand unmarried women to indicate that they are in the market. Miss, Mrs., and Mr. are the three most distinctly disagreeable words in the language in sound and sense. Two are corruptions of mistress, the other of master. In the general abolition of social titles in this our country, they miraculously escape to plague us. If we must have them, let us be consistent and give one to the unmarried man. I venture to suggest mush, abbreviated to MH. Molecule. Noun. The ultimate indivisible unit of matter. It is distinguished from the corpuscle also the ultimate indivisible unit of matter, by a closer resemblance to the atom, also the ultimate indivisible unit of matter. Three great scientific theories of the structure of the universe are the molecular, the corpuscular, and the atomic. A fourth affirms, with Heichel, the condensation or precipitation of matter from ether, whose existence is proved by the condensation or precipitation. The present trend of scientific thought is toward the theory of ions. The ion differs from the molecule, the corpuscle, and the atom in that it is an ion. A fifth theory is held by idiots, but it is doubtful if they know any more about the matter than the others. Monad. No. The ultimate indivisible unit of matter. See molecule. According to Leibniz, as nearly as he seems willing to be understood, the monad has body without bulk, and mind without manifestation. Leibniz knows him by the innate power of considering. He has founded upon him a theory of the universe, which the creature bears without resentment, for the monad is a gentleman. Small as he is, the monad contains all the powers and possibilities needful to his evolution into a German philosopher of the first class, altogether a very capable little fellow. He is not to be confounded with the microbe or bacillus. By its inability to discern him, a good microscope shows him to be of an entirely distinct species. Monarch, noun, a person engaged in reigning. Formerly the monarch ruled, as the derivation of the word attests, and as many subjects have had occasion to learn. In Russia and the Orient, the monarch has still a considerable influence in public affairs and in the disposition of the human head. But in Western Europe, political administration is mostly entrusted to his ministers, he being somewhat preoccupied with reflections related to the status of his own head. Monarchical Government Noun government. Monday, noun. In Christian countries, the day after the baseball game. Money, noun. A blessing that is of no advantage to us, excepting when we part with it. An evidence of culture and a passport to polite society. Supportable property. Monkey, noun. An arboreal animal which makes itself at home in genealogical trees. Monosyllabic, 
adjective, composed of words of one syllable. For literary babes who never tire of testifying their delight in the vapid compound by appropriate googling, the words are commonly Saxon, that is to say, words of a barbarous people destitute of ideas and incapable of any but the most elementary sentiments and emotions. The man who writes in Saxon is the man to use an axon. By Judebrus. Monsignor, noun a high ecclesiastic title, of which the founder of our religion overlooked the advantages. Monument, noun, a structure intended to commemorate something which either needs no commemoration or cannot be commemorated. The bones of Agamemnon are a show, and ruined is his royal monument, but Agamemnon's fame suffers no diminution. In consequence, the monument custom has its reductions ad absurdum in monuments to the unknown dead, that is to say, monuments to perpetuate the memory of those who have left no memory. Moral. Adjective. Conforming to a local and mutable standard of right, having the quality of general expediency. It is said there be a range of mountains in the east, on one side of the which certain conducts are immoral, yet on the other side there are holden in good esteem, whereby the mountaineer is much conveyanced, for it is given to him to go down either way and act as it shall suit his mood, without offence. From Gook's Meditations More Adjective the comparative degree of too much. Mouse, noun, an animal which strews its path with fainting women. As in Rome, Christians were thrown to the lions, so centuries earlier in Atumbui, the most ancient and famous city of the world, female heretics were thrown to the mice. Chakatzap, the historian, the only autumn wump, whose writings have descended to us, says that these martyrs met their death with little dignity and much exertion. He even attempts to esculpate the mice, such as the malice of bigotry, by declaring that the unfortunate women perished, some from exhaustion, some of broken necks from falling over their own feet, and some from lack of restoratives. The mice, he avers, enjoyed the pleasures of the chase with composure. But if Roman history is nine-tenths lying, we can hardly expect a smaller proportion of that rhetorical figure in the annals of a people capable of so incredible cruelty to lovely woman, for a hard heart has a false tongue. Mousquetaire Now, a long glove covering a part of the arm, worn in New Jersey, but mousquetaire is a mighty poor way to spell musketeer. Mouth Now, in man, the gateway to the soul. In woman, the outlet of the heart. Mugwump. Noun. In politics, one afflicted with self-respect and addicted to the vice of independence. A term of contempt. Mulatto. Noun. A child of two races, ashamed of both. Multitude. Noun. A crowd, the source of political wisdom and virtue. In a republic, the object of the statesman's adoration. In a multitude of counselors there is wisdom, saith the proverb. If many men of equal individual wisdom are wiser than any one of them, it must be that they acquire the excess of wisdom by the mere act of getting together. Whence comes it? Obviously from nowhere, as well say that a range of mountains is higher than the single mountain composing it. A multitude is as wise as its wisest member if it obey him. If not, it is no wiser than its most foolish. Mummy, noun, an ancient Egyptian formerly in universal use among modern civilized nations as medicine, and now engaged in supplying art with an excellent pigment. He is handy, too, in museums in gratifying the vulgar curiosity that serves to distinguish man from the lower animals. By means of the mummy, mankind, it is said, attest to the gods its respect for the dead. We plunder his tomb, be he sinner or saint, distill him for psychic and grind him for paint. Exhibit for money his poor shrunken frame, and with levity flock to the scent of the shame. O oh, tell me, ye gods, for the use of my rhyme, for respecting the dead, what's the limit of time? By Scopus Brune. Mustang, noun. 
an indocile horse of the western plains, in English society the American wife of an English nobleman. Myrmidon, noun, a follower of Achilles, particularly when he didn't lead. Mythology, noun, the body of a primitive people's beliefs concerning its origin, early history, heroes, deities, and so forth, as distinguished from the true accounts which it invents later. End of letter M in the Devil's Dictionary Recorded by Kevin Devine